So let me start first of all with um, Martha Albertson Feynman, who is the Robert Woodruff Professor of, um, at Emory University Law School and the founder and director of the Feminism and Legal Theory Project, as well as the founding director of the Vulnerability and Human Condition Project at Emory University. She's the author uh, and editor of numerous books, and her 2008 article entitled The Vulnerable Subject, Anchoring Equality in the Human Condition, was published in the Yale Journal of Law and Feminism um, and is a foundational theoretical articulation of the issues that we will be discussing today. We're especially pleased um, that Professor Feynman is here with us. Eva Jarek is the Julian Park Professor of Comparative Literature at the University of Buffalo, and she works on feminist theory, modernism, ethics, and critical theory. She's the author and editor of several books, including An Ethics of Dissensus, Feminism, Postmodernity, and the Politics of Radical Democracy. And she'll be talking today um, particularly about the ways in which uh, feminist theory and, and the theory surrounding vulnerability studies interact with each other. Colin Diane is the Robert Penn Warren Professor of the Humanities at Vanderbilt University. She's the author of several books, most recently, The Story of Cruel and Unusual, which confronts readers with the history of how certain forms of state violence, brutality, and even torture came to be considered acceptable and legal. And more recently, The Law is a White Dog, How Legal Rituals Make and Unmake Persons. And finally, Ilaria Vani is head of the Cultural Studies Group and Senior Lecturer in International Studies at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. So she gets the prize for having traveled the farthest to be with us today. And she's vertical after only having just arrived after 18 hours yesterday. So we're so glad she's here. Um, she's a specialist in visual cultures, multimedia practices, and activism, and the co-author with Marcello Tari of an article called On the Li Life and Deeds of San Precario, Patron Saint of Precarious Workers and Lives. And I just want to mention briefly, she will be talking about the image that appears on our program. We've had lots of questions about, what is this image? Um, and it comes out of this um, political movement in Italy that is called the San Precario movement, Saint Precarious. Um, who was born about 10 years ago, almost to the day, um, and invented saint, if they aren't all invented, um, and um, uh, the patron saint of precarious workers and precarious people. And so the image um, that appears here that she'll be talking about in more depth is an adaptation of the Hindu goddess Durga, um, and who is a goddess of power, and this particular image has been taken up by the San Precario movement as a kind of remix, religious iconographic remix of, um, uh, of divinity um, to make a point about precarity. But she will talk about that more. So um, I'm very glad that she's here to give us um, some visuality to go with our um, discussion and also to think uh, internationally about the different ways in which um, these uh, discourses and images get, get mobilized. So again, our panelists will speak for 15 to 20 minutes each, one after the other. Um, I'll come back up here to moderate some conversation among the four, and then we'll open it up for a conversation with everyone here. Welcome, I'm really glad that you're all here. I hope we have a great conference. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here uh, and, and take part in this uh, conference on vulnerability. Um, I, in 2007, we started to think about vulnerability as a theoretical concept um, at Emory University, and in, uh, in fact, out of that was born the Vulnerability in the Human Condition Initiative, and um, on the table out front there is material about this initiative, um, which I hope you take. Uh, we have quite an extensive uh, website, which also gives access to a number of the important articles that have been written about vulnerability. Um, we have a visiting scholar program, too, which I hope uh, some of you will be interested in taking part in, and you can find out again about that from here. Um, I thought of my development of the concept of vulnerability and the idea of a vulnerable subject when I began to think about it several years ago as a stealthily disguised human rights discourse fashioned for an American audience. We're not very receptive, actually, to human rights discourse in the United States. But the concept has actually evolved for me from those early articulations, and I now think that vulnerability has some significant differences as an approach from human rights, particularly the, in that looking at vulnerability decidedly focuses us on exploring the nature of the human rather than the rights part of the human rights trope. 
Importantly, considerations of vulnerability bring societal institutions in addition to the state and the individual uh, into the discussion and under scrutiny. Vulnerability is posited as the characteristic that both positions us in relation to each other as human beings and also establishes a relationship of responsibility for the state with us as citizens. Ultimately, recognition of human vulnerability forms the basis for a claim that the state must be more responsive. And here I'm talking about the American state in particular. In Western liberal tradition, we have built our notions of what constitutes equality as well as the appropriate relationship between the state, institutional, and individual responsibility around the construct of an autonomous, independent, and self-sufficient political subject. The paramount right is the right to liberty, not to equality, and this right to equality is reduced to an, uh, an equivalence of treatment an anti-discrimination model. The state is restrained and the state and state intervention is viewed as exceptional, not a responsive state, but rather a limited, very limited state. Our primary metaphor for looking at social and institutional relationships, at least outside of the family, is that of contract. Society is conceptualized as constituted through a social construct, contract in individual transactions and interactions with the state and its institutions are posited to involve autonomous and independent actors in the process of negotiation, bargaining, and consent, in other words, in contract with each other. Competence is assumed and differences in power, circumstances, or actual ability are ignored. Thus constructed, this autonomous liberal subject is at the heart of political and legal thought. My work raises an important question in regard to this autonomous liberal subject, which is, if our body, bodily fragility, material needs, and the possibility of messy dependency that they signify cannot be ignored in life, how can they be absent in our theories about equality, society, politics, and law? Unfortunately, dependency is not part of any mainstream theory in politics or law, it is ignored for the most part or deemed deviant, a social problem when it's impossible to ignore. In 2004, I published a book called The Autonomy, Autonomy Myth, A Theory of Dependency, in which I argued that we need a more complex and nuanced understanding of what is encompassed by this single term, dependency. In its most basic form, of course, dependency should be thought of as inevitable. It is developmental and biological in nature. All of us are dependent on others for care and provision as infants, and many of us will become dependent as we age, are taken ill, or become disabled. This form of dependency is generally viewed as sympathetic and sparks our charitable impulses as well as governmental programs. But there's a second form of dependency that needs to be discussed in relation to, but separate from, inevitable dependency. And this second form of dependency is much less obvious, but when it is noticed, it is often stigmatized and condemned. And I have labeled this second form of dependency derivative, derivative dependency, to reflect the very simple but often overlooked fact that those who care for the inevitable dependence are themselves dependent on resources in order to successfully accomplish that care. Now this form of dependency, derivative dependency, is not inevitable, nor is it universally experienced as is inevitable dependency. Rather, it is socially imposed through the construction of institutions such as the family with roles and relationships traditionally defined and differentiated along gendered lines. Hence, we find an historic difference in expectations and aspirations attached to dichotomous pairings within the family, husband versus wife, father versus mother, son versus daughter. It has proven difficult to gain true gender equality given this set of institutional arrangements and expectations and the persistence of traditional family relationships. Now, in the autonomy myth, I argued for a more collective approach to dependency, 
a reallocation of responsibility for dependency that would place some obligation on other societal institutions, not just the family, other societal institutions, including the market and the state. This reallocation of responsibility seemed particularly appropriate to me, at least, um, since both the state and market institutions reaped the benefits of care work uh, produced in the form of the reproduction and regeneration of society. In other words, it's care work, work in the family, that produces the citizen, the taxpayer, payer, the worker, and so on. And in fact, I accused these other institutions of freeloading on the work that was not in the family. And I do not take that back. <laughs> because what I call inevitable dependency is understood to be episodic, and it is in fact episodic, and shifting in degree over the lifetime of an individual, uh, many mainstream political and social theorists can and often do conveniently ignore dependency in spinning out their theories about justice, efficiency, or liberty. So they ignore, ignore inevitable dependency. In their hands, this form of dependency if it's acknowledged at all, is merely a stage that the autonomous liberal subject has long ago transcended or left behind and therefore is of no pressing theoretical interest. As for derivative dependency, that is conveniently dismissed by reference to the liberal contractarian constructs of individual choice and the norm of personal responsibility. Those who take up the caretaking role have chosen to do so and should not then complain about their situation or expect others to subsidize their choices. Here we see that the division between the public and the private has real tenacity. In spite of decades of critical commentary showing the that the distinction does not hold up, prominent American theorists continue to deal with dependency by relegating its burdens of caretaking to the family that family is conceptualized within a zone of privacy beyond the scope of state concern, at least absent extraordinary failure, such as family abuse or neglect. Thus largely rendered invisible within the family, dependency can comfortably be privatized and mistakenly assumed to be adequately managed for the vast majority of people. Now, from my work on dependency, I turn to the concept of vulnerability and the idea of the vulnerable subject. And in fact, this was a very natural evolution uh, in my work. I have found uh, this idea of vulnerability to be much more theoretical, th theoretically powerful uh, than dependency in arguing for a more substantive vision of equality and for a more responsive uh, state. When I began this work in 2007, uh, first thing I noticed was the designation of vulnerable was used to set aside some groups and some individuals uh, considered disadvantaged or unsuccessful within the larger society. Children, prisoners, single mothers, the very poor, vulnerable populations. The term vulnerable populations has an air of victimhood, deprivation, dependency, or pathology attached to it. But that's not how I look at it. I think the term vulnerable populations is a complement to the autonomous liberal subject. Vulnerable population embodies the idea that some of us are failures, that we deviate from the ideals embodied in the liberal, autonomous liberal uh, subject. My work uh, has developed the concept of vulnerability detached from specific subgroups. And in fact, I insist on asserting that vulnerability is universal. It is also constant. It is part of the human condition. As embodied beings, we are all vulnerable all the time. The political subject, therefore, should not be the autonomous liberal subject, but the vulnerable subject. And that should be at the center of the way that we think about society and state responsibility. Our embodiment carries with it the imminent or every, ever possible possibility of harm, injury, and misfortune. And bodily harms can, of course, take a variety of forms and range from those that are mildly annoying uh, to those that are catastrophically devastating and permanent in nature. Bodily harm can result accidentally or ca be caused by intentional actions. Bodily harm can result from the unleashing of forces of nature, from the mere passage of time, or from the fact that we as human beings exist in a world full of often unpredictable material realities. 
And while we can attempt to lessen risk or to act to mitigate the possible manifestations of our vulnerability, the possibility of harm can never be eliminated. Many harms are beyond individual or even human control. The process of aging and death, for example, are clear internal biological processes that show the limitations of human ability to avoid the ultimate consequences of our embodiment. <clears throat> internal and external causes of harm also relate to human vulnerability. It's important to realize that vulnerability is complex and it can manifest itself in multiple forms. <clears throat> Our bodily vulnerability is compounded by the possibility that should we succumb to illness or injury, there may be accompanying harm, not bodily harm, a disruption of existing employment, economic, or family relationships. These harms are not located in the body itself, but in the interruption or destruction of institutional or social relationships. This form of harm can be as catastrophic to an individual as the bodily variety and also illustrates how human beings are dependent upon social institutions. But I don't want to talk about vulnerability, and I do not talk about it only in terms of harm and depressing things like that. <laughs> but also vulnerability, and I think it's a really important part of vulnerability analysis as we're developing at Emory, is also generative and positive. In fact, it is our human vulnerability, our human needs, that cause us to reach out and form relationships, that cause us to form things like families, that cause families to form communities, to, that, form, uh, that uh, cause communities to form political and social organizations on both national and international levels. Our embodiment, in other words, opens us up to very positive experiences of love and desire and longing. This last point brings me to a somewhat paradoxical point about vulnerability. While human, human vulnerability is universal, constant, and complex, it is also particular, right? also particular. While all human beings stand in a position of constant vulnerability, we are positioned differently. And there are two forms of difference that um, I've been working on that I think are relevant in this regard. First, we have different forms of embodiment, that's an obvious point. So we have different abilities, we have different physical uh, capabilities, we have different characteristics. And in fact, a lot of um, discrimination is directed towards those embodied differences among human beings. And in that context, an anti-discrimination approach, a formal equality approach is entirely appropriate to address that kind of harm. But there are, there's a second difference that I think is, is really uh, the most important part of a vulnerability analysis, and that is the differences of, uh, that arise because we as individuals are situated differently within webs of economic and institutional uh, relationships. And this again is the most significant thing I think about the vulnerability analysis. Important in regard to this particular point is the fact that our individual experiences of vulnerability vary according to the quality and quantity of resources that we possess and can command at the point of crisis or the point of opportunity. So what resources have we accumulated when we're confronted with either crisis or opportunity? While society cannot eradicate our vulnerability, it can and does mediate, compensate, and lessen our vulnerability through programs, institutions, and structures. Significantly, the counterpoint to vulnerability is not invulnerability, for that is impossible to achieve, but rather the resilience that comes from having some means with which to address and confront misfortune or to take advantage of opportunities. So the final component of a vulnerability analysis focuses attention on these institutions that give us resilience in relation to our human vulnerability. Societal institutions are theorized as having grown up around vulnerability and in response to vulnerability. And these institutions collectively form systems that play an important role in lessening, ameliorating, and compensating for vulnerability. Together and independently, they provide us with resources in the form of advantages or coping mechanisms that cushion us when we are facing misfortune and disaster and violence and give us options and open up possibilities throughout our life. 
There are at least five different types of resources or assets that societal organizations and institutions can provide that I identify in my work, and I'll just go briefly over these in the interest of time. Physical resources are the physical goods or material things that determine our present quality of life, such as housing, food, entertainment, and means of transportation. Uh, and we can talk about bank accounts in this context, too. Second, like physical assets, human resources uh, affect material well-being. And these are the goods that contribute to our development as human beings and allow our participation in the market and make possible the accumulation of material resources that help to boost our resilience in the face of vulnerability. And these, of course, are provided by um, education, training, knowledge, and experience where we collect what is sometimes referred to as human capital. The third types of resources are societal are social assets, rather. Social assets are resources that are provided by less tangible and not so easily quantifiable relationships. And these include social networks from which we gain support and strength. And the family, of course, is a major institution in this regard, providing social resources, particularly to the young or to others in need of care. The fourth set of resources that I talk about are ecological resources. Uh, ecological resources are conferred through our position in relation to the physical or natural environment in which we find ourselves and also to some extent the built environment, which I haven't spent much time on but, but want to spend more time on. Fifth and finally, existential resources are provided by systems of belief and aesthetics such as religion, culture, or art, and perhaps even politics. Uh, these systems can help us understand our place within the world and allow us to see meaning and beauty in our existence. Finally, there is a link between these various types of resources and state responsibility. This is the final step in my uh, vulnerability analysis. Many of the institutions providing resources that give us resilience can only be brought into legal existence through state mechanisms, through law. Entities such as corporations, schools, workplaces, families, or churches are legitimated and given a status that confers on them benefits and protections by law. Their very content and meaning is defined through state processes through law. The dissolution of many of these entities is also accomplished only through state processes. State involvement in the creation and maintenance of these institutions requires that the state be vigilant in ensuring that the distribution of the resources these institutions help us produce is accomplished with attention to public values, including equality and justice, or maybe particularly equality and justice, objectives that are beyond private or profit motivation. Uh, we know that societal institutions are not foolproof shelters, even in the short term, and this again mandates state monitoring. Uh, societal institutions should be understood as vulnerable entities in and of themselves. They may fail in the wake of market fluctuations, changing international politics, institutional and political compromises, or human prejudice. They may be captured or corrupted. Even the most established institutions viewed over time are potentially unstable and susceptible to challenges from both internal and external forces. The introduction of societal institutions into the discussion of human vulnerability has the significant effect of supplementing our attention to the individual subject and individual responsibility, which of course is dominant in current discussions about state responsibility and um, privatization of social welfare systems. Vulnerability places the individual in societal or institutional context, thus brings, into thus brings in historic and existing inequalities and the need for a state responsive to those existing and structural inequalities. Now, it must be made clear when we talk about the response of state that the choice is not between an active state on the one hand versus an inactive state on the other. Rather, the choice is whether or not we are going to demand that the state implement a comprehensive and just equality regime that ensures access of opportunity consistent with a realistic conception of the human subject. In other words, the vulnerable subject. While prevail several prevailing American myths currently impede the establishment of a more responsive state, a state more responsive to the vulnerable subject, the challenge, I think, for us as scholars and activists going forward 
is to think beyond the current ideological constraints and consider the possibility of an active state in a non-authoritarian way. This theoretical task of reconceptualizing the role of the state requires that we imagine responsive structures whereby state involvement actually empowers us as vulnerable subjects by addressing existing inequalities of circumstance that result from undue privilege or institutional advantage that's been produced by uh, decades, actually. State mechanisms that ensure a more equitable access to institutional assets by adjusting the unjust distribution of privilege and opportunity across society would certainly contribute to a more robust democracy and greater public participation. It's important, however, to conclude with the observation that at least as I'm developing the concept, a vulnerability approach does not mean that different treatment, even the conferral of privilege or advantage on some, is never warranted. It does mean, however, that if the state tolerates institutional conferral of privilege or advantage, there is an affirmative obligation on the state and its institutions to offer explanations for the disparate circumstances. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this conference. It's a real privilege. And I would like to begin with a bad rap on responsibility, which I think is important to know, at least briefly, before I will try to change perspectives. To my surprise, I found out when I started doing a little bit of research on vulnerability that so-called vulnerability studies is not a new phenomenon, that it emerged in the 70s as a significant area of research in international social and political sciences, combining sociology, climate change, politics, and geography. These interdisciplinary studies of vulnerability are concerned with the exposure of populations to biological, economic, and political hazards. In the area of national defense in particular, vulnerability means a potential failure of security or a threat uh, of an attack, usually imaginary threat, by hostile forces, most recently terrorism. From natural disasters to political catastrophes, from economic crisis to weakness of military defense, the patterns and causes of vulnerability are to be measured, prevented, and managed. This is indeed the goal of global vulnerability studies, such as, for instance, US National Vulnerability da Database or UN Institute for Vulnerability. Whether these are located in political, national, or international organizations such as UN. Since such studies aim to control and protect populations and natural environments across the globe, vulnerability conceived in this way uh, rep might represent the expansion of biopolitics on the global scale. At least this is the question that I want to raise. The protection of vulnerable populations, the emblem of which are often stereotyped, uh, racialized women and children, often occurs in the name of security. So then in those studies, the opposite of vulnerability is not resilience, but security, which according to Hart and Nagri represents a new legitimation of biopower. Since the mobilization of military or police power in the name of security requires constant threat, the vulnerability of, of population, mainstream population, uh, to the internal or external dangers, whether this is terrorism, the influx of illegal immigrants, drug wars, uh, uh, you can name uh, recently another atomic threat, uh, provides the means of such legitimation. On the other end of the spectrum, and you can Google that more easily than I can do, and no doubt connected to the security population as its dialectical others, vulnerability occupies self-help terrain. From books to talk shows, vulnerability signifies a risk that can be managed by individuals themselves, or it can be reclaimed as a new empathy uh, to be cultivated in a kind of individual manner. As 
individual moral virtue vulnerability loses its negative connotation and becomes associated instead of feminized empathy and the ability to connect with others. Thus, the security of population has its counterpart in this individual morality of empathy. The main question that I think I want to raise and this whole conference raises is whether feminist studies of vulnerability can provide an alternative to biopolitics or liberal individualism because that's our first, especially uh, liberal individualism, it's the kind of, can be the first association of vulnerability. Can vulnerability signify a different intersection between politics and ethics? If vulnerability is to be reclaimed by feminist politics, it is important to stress its two contradictory meanings. First, it is important to remember that in feminist and anti-racist struggles, vulnerability has always been uh, at the core of feminist movement, often under different names, such as disempowerment, disenfranchisement, discrimination, and so forth. And it has been intertwined indeed with the analysis of the subjection to racist and sexist violence, bodily injury, uh, economic exploitation, and so forth. However, what is quote unquote new in the new feminist vulnerability studies, of which this conference is an example, is that scholars uh, like ourselves are also invited to explore possible positive, transformative meanings of vulnerability. To explore such a kind of transformative uh, approach, I want to focus in my presentation today on the analysis of vulnerability as a condition of intersubjection, intersubjective action and political engagement. The second idea that I want to suggest, even though I will not have time to develop it, is that these two forms of political vulnerability, political disempowerment and political action are interconnected with the third ethical meaning of vulnerability. By ethics here, I do not mean privatized morality of virtue, but rather a specific understanding of ethic proposed by Levinas, and Elizabeth Costelli have already mentioned his work, uh, and indeed his work has been a source of inspiration for many feminist scholars, myself uh, included, um, and so forth. Uh, according to Levinas, ethics shifts the concern from the subject's vulnerability to the plight of others. Such an ethics calls for responsibility for others' exposure to violence, the call for vigilance against aggression that others' fragility might provoke. Not opposed to political struggles for freedom, such responsibility foregrounds what I call the ethical dimension of freedom. As I have argued uh, repeatedly, any contestation of political exclusion, inequality, and domination has to be do uh, kind of situated within this horizon of ethical responsibility. In other words, action itself can be motivated not only by one's own uh, injury or one's own group injury or political conviction, but also by ethical res responsibility to multiple others. Understood as a response rather than initiative of an empowered subject, action expands Levinas's argument that justice, solidarity, and desire for a better society are inconceivable without such an ethical relation uh, to others who call us to responsibility. In other words, action itself can be seen as a modality of an ethical response. Yet, what notion of political action and agency are presupposed by this interrelation between ethics and politics of vulnerability. And by politics of vulnerability, I always mean this double sense of disempowerment and action. It's not agency associated with resilience and strength rather than vulnerability. To analyze briefly vulnerability as a condition of agency, I would like to turn to Hannah Arendt's work. 
Arendt, of course, lived through and analyzed in her work the darkest moments of the 20th century, anti-Semitism, totalitarianism, Holocaust, genocide, and nuclear explosion, and the ongoing threat of the total annihilation of life on Earth by nuclear power. And yet, at the core of her work is the notion of transformative political action. One of the most important preconditions of such action is the heterogeneity and the plurality of human agents. Political engagement depends on the coming together of strangers, uh, and strangers not only divided by race, class, and gender, but by your uh, strangers such as your annoying neighbor or your annoying mother with very different convictions than your own. Such a plurality of convictions and others is an ongoing target of violence and disciplinary power, but it cannot be eradicated without the destruction of what Arendt also calls the human condition. Despite the limitations of her work, for instance, the separation of, between the private and the political, Arendt's notion of action contests not only liberal individualism, but also its opposite, the impersonal operations of power and the impersonal laws of history. Supported by democratic institutions, and that's important to stress, action presupposes the worldly space of in-between or the formation of the public, which can be quite portable in this uh, uh, new electronic age. One crucial implication of feminist analysis of political domination in this respect is that the political spaces of intersubjective participation are severely limited by multiple exclusions of subjugated groups from the political domain. Nonetheless, as the history of political protests, marches, and struggles shows us again and again and again, from the Arab Spring to Occupy Wall Street movement, the marginalized groups can contest and occupy the public in order to reconstruct it and change the political uh, relations and institutions. This is the implication of Arendt's claim that action is intertwined not only with the realization of particular demands, but more fundamentally, always, in addition to these demands, was the world-building capacity. I would like to suggest that such a world-building capacity is always at stake in feminist struggles, no matter what the specific issues are, whether it is economic disenfranchisement or access to uh, contraception again. Oh, can't believe that, right? Uh, uh, that uh, birth control and contraception has to be uh, on the agenda again. Another important element of Arendt's theory of action for feminism is its non-foundational character. Since action depends on the uniqueness and the plurality of political agents, which includes but exceeds gender, race, ethnicity, and class differences, political engagement does not presuppose identity politics. This approach is especially important for feminist critiques of subjectivity and gender identity, which, as Butler points out, are often criticized as failing to formulate agency. Arendt, however, reverses the usual model of agency, according to which action realizes the intentions uh, of the subject. As she puts it, I quote, Nobody is the author of action. Thus, it is not agency that produces action, but on the reverse, it is action that discloses and creates intersubjective agency for the first time. The first important uh, consequence of this topsy-turvy approach to action and, and agency is that agency is not a strength or even resilience that can be possessed or identity that can be known. The second consequence is that agency does not exist in isolation, but emerges 
uh, from our relations with others or is destroyed by our relations with others. And finally, intersubjective agency means that every actor, political agent, is at the same time a passive sufferer, that she affects and is being affected by others. And I quote from Arendt, to do and to suffer are like opposite sides of the same coin. Needless to say, such agency and action is precarious. The greatest vulnerability of intersubjective agency is, of course, that it will be diminished with the dispersal of the group. Since agency is created through praxis, human capacities depend on the relations with strangers coming together for the purpose of action, and they disappear, quote, when for whatever reason the participants disperse. Since agency cannot endure apart from human togetherness, it can be dispersed by brutal violence, as we witness right now uh, the attempts to do so in Syria, or dissipated from within when the participants disperse or are driven apart by internal conflicts. Another way the instability of action manifests itself lies in the obscurity of political motivations. Once we depart from the premise of the self-grounding political subject as the basis of feminist politics, we have to accept that actors do not know others with whom they act. That's easier to understand. But also, and that's the more difficult wrinkle, to negotiate, as, agent, uh, as Arendt insists, they do not know themselves. Their motivations and inclinations are like, quote, demons or dark oracles that might be more evident to others than to ourselves. And most importantly, the open-ended and dynamic process of, uh, of action is characterized by the unpredictability of the so-called outcomes. As we can see in the historical election of President Obama or in the current scary horror spectacle of Republican nomination, despite CNN magic wall, great metaphor, right? Statistical analysis and the obscene influence of money, political engagement even on this most vacuous uh, but nonetheless uh, fundamental um, level as voting, is unpredictable. Its results are always too close to call. And once the political process becomes predictable, it is no longer action but behavior. One may wonder how action without pre-existing agency, identity, resilience, uh, and durability is possible at all. According to Arendt, what enables action despite the fragility and unpredictability of human interactions is the alliance based on mutual promises. Promise is the only force, according to Arendt, that can create a sense of togetherness while respecting plurality and a divergence of participants. And promise can be very implicit. Implicit, hey, are you coming to this conference? Yes, yes, I will come, I will see you. Or are you coming to this demonstration? Yes, I will meet you at Times Square or whatever. That's what she means. It's this kind of flimsical promise. Uh, it's not the contractual promise uh, necessary uh, at all. By gathering strangers together for the purpose of action, promise is merely a guidepost in the ocean of uncertainty. One, it is transformed into predictability and contract, and Nietzsche has taught us the consequences of such transformation, promise becomes self-defeating. In so doing, promise cuts across the binary opposition, structuring the most approaches to politics, power, weakness, violence, security, agency, passivity, vulnerability, resilience, identity politics, confusion, uh, interdependence, isolation. To put it in terms of feminist analysis, it is promise rather than common interest or identity politics or even interdependence that creates solidarity among women despite the deep-seated differences and inequalities among us. 
Since it is condition of possibility of acting, promises also a certain ground for thinking the relationship between politics and ethics of vulnerability. Promise obligates us to each other, and such bonds are a political modality of responsibility for others and the common world in which we live. So to conclude very briefly, insofar as it is tied to intersubjective capacity to create a new world and obligations to others, vulnerability is not only an effect of disempowerment, but also a paradoxical condition of political transformation. The ethical and political modalities of vulnerability exceed individual and collective agency without plunging us into political powerlessness. Consequently, vulnerability is not a weakness to be overcome or managed in the name of security because, as Arendt puts it, it is a prize of mundane freedom. Thank you very much. I'm <laughs> delighted to be here and to share some of my new work with you. Um, this is in part a story about dogs and the humans who kill them, not merely about human vulnerability or human needs. It is also about why, why dogs matter now to us as social and political animals. In this conjuncture of animal-human affect, we learn much about the wrong equation between animal ferocity and human cruelty. Let me begin with a question. What is the terrain for human cruelty and who gets to command its shifts in species and race? It is impossible here to produce the necessary elaborations on a brutality that comes before and after all the enlightenments that have sanctioned violence and demand our response and responsibility. So I direct my thoughts today to reorienting the way we think politically and I have recourse to an ethics that is also political unsettled as I am by the prospect of distinctions, not only of subject, but of genre, that allow the continued dispossession of those creatures, human and non-human alike, delivered to subjection without redress. Something about death and dogs makes humans think. When dogs are killed by humans, we learn something basic about how we come to know and when we ought to care. There remains something equivocal about our assumptions about human and animal, about the role of reason in making us who we are. So in considering the subject of vulnerability, I am drawn to the event of non-human suffering. In considering the relation between humans and dogs, I am aware of ma how many humans are involved in the killing of dogs perpetually and even humanely, and the ruses of beneficence as key to rituals of exclusion continue to preoccupy me. Whether we read about dogs doused in gasoline and burned alive or dogs killed by humane societies, we are pushed to ask how to define cruelty. But not just cruelty, since kindness so often comes along with it. Vulnerability, as Anat Pick writes in Creaturely Poetics, does not entail an appeal to humanitarian sympathies. And today I shall try to explain why we need to eschew any ethics of care, residual humanism, or enunciation of rights in face of atrocity. We need to rethink the liberal ideal of consensus and how it banishes and imperils. The involvement of humans in the death of dogs, stray or owned, persists at a time that the new brand of militarized but causal forces of the state assault unarmed citizens, when the prison emerges as the central public institution in the United States, both curbing life and categorizing persons. This intensification of subjection reinforces control and shatters resistance while channeling docility and obedience. In numerous ways, the tr twin strategies for degradation and control of those considered expendable and unfit are prepared for not only through prison practices that are ever more refined, torturous, and invisible, 
but also through the treatment of dogs. Why dogs? Status and the meaning of life often comes with the kind of dog owned. If a person chooses to get a dog that can fit into a teacup or hand, they are actually called teacups, turned into something inanimate to be held. This choice says something about the nuances of human sensibility. These dogs are cute, as cute as the dogs in China painted to look like zebras or tigers. So humans are not only transforming the environment and transforming nature, but making their pets in their own image. This image is no mere replica, but rather an icon of what they need most, a mere thing that can be held, kept, controlled, and displayed. It is with these diminished items before us, coddled and personalized, that we must look at something called the pit bull type dogs, which stand in for a number of figures of dispossession. They are scorned and exterminated. We are living in a time of extinctions, and dogs are manifestly disposable objects. They are at our mercy. They have no safe haven. The Humane Society of the United, Sta of the United States, like the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, is where certain types of dogs meet their deaths by euthanasia in the largest numbers. Terms like cruelty and humane treatment undergo trials of definition when dogs are at issue, since self-righteous care not only justifies but masks violence. And increasingly, interestingly enough, the activities of animal welfare coincide with and are at times indistinguishable from the preemptive violence that targets dogs and their owners. In fact, in a number of recent cases, it is difficult to tell whether the human or the non-human is the object of punishment. If pit bulls are the icon of dangerous dog, then a certain kind of owner or breeder becomes the icon of bad masculinity, a brute offense to public sensibility. The seizures, detentions, and extermination of pit bulls then, sanctioned by law, expose the statutory logic for making preemptive justice constitutionally permissible. Now I'm arguing, perhaps a difficult argument, people keep saying, what is this? What is this turn to dogs? I want to try to explain. It seems to me canine profiling supplies the terms for inclusion and ostracism, and even the suspension of due process rights. At a time when our government is labeling certain persons as threats, alleged terrorists, enemy aliens, illegal immigrants, ordinary people who want to get on airplanes, we need to ask how the seizure and destruction of dogs deemed contraband becomes a medium for the intimidation control and debasement of humans in turn. Nothing can be more fictitious than a purely legal inferiority Tocqueville wrote in Democracy in America. And when the pressure is on to construct inferiority, legally and socially, the law toys with the perils of hierarchical thinking even as it perpetuates its effects. So I'm taking dogs to stand in for a bridge the bridge that joins persons to things, both in our law and legal concepts and in the real world of our daily lives. The continuity is there and dogs form the bridge. The bridge is what matters. It offers the connectivity between gradations of personhood and our animality. So I want to just conjure up a rather remote and uncertain reservoir on which all creatures might draw, but from which most humans have learned to cut themselves off completely. My aim here is not to refer to some concept of relativism, but rather to reshuffle our conceptual schemes. What I propose is a resistance to the terms of our epistemological debates, and so to cast doubt on the robustness and transportability of the ontological partitions they presuppose, body and mind, animality and humanity, nature and culture, social and political. Quite simply, we have to recognize how inhuman we are for opposing humans to animals. Why, to take up Mary Midgley's point in Animals and Why They Matter, does a sense of unreality block our attempts to understand our moral relations with animals? Why is the question of the animal or the animo, as Derrida put it at the end of his life, so hard to fit into our ethical system? I am reminded of Hannah Arendt's attempt to save political action 
and political understandings of action from humanitarianism, an argument that has led me to my work on the exterminating rituals of humane societies that kill certain breeds with impunity. Like Carl Schmitt, she feared and understood the cunning of any properly political project of humanity. Both struggled with human rights talk, the language of humanity that has certain incalculable effects. What then are the implications of a logic at the heart of an illegality that is moderated, legitimized, and even reproduced by the humanitarian concern that is in fact analogous to it? And this is probably the driving force of my work. Uprootedness and reappropriation put in question the boundaries of humanity are the making and management of human boundary objects. This management, as I've seen in my work in Haiti after the earthquake, demands that we reinterpret the human in terms like human treatment or humanitarian. UN peacekeeping forces in Haiti and the moral sensitivity of welfare bodies, non-governmental organizations, and local charities, both civil, secular, and religious, provide the minimum conditions to keep alive defective citizens or non-citizen subjects. Because once cared for as part of a humanitarian crisis, these persons cease to exist except as abandoned individuals, ruled according to the ways and means of their abandonment. So neither depersonalization nor dehumanization matters as much in thinking, it seems to me, a vulnerability as a capacious rendering of the human and non-human animal. What I am calling today, following Annette Pick and others, the creaturely. I'm not interested here in animal rights and giving animals what we think it is we get as bearers of rights and obligations in standard liberal moral terms. Rather, I want to examine what happens in certain cases for certain kinds of dogs and for certain kinds of persons when their fates intertwine, when the divide between human and non-human no longer matters. Some creatures are at risk and threatened not only by the police power, but also by the liberal and enlightened who abhor cruelty to animals and who feel sustained by projections of social value and moral good. Put more simply, I want to consider what is at stake when a morality-inspired legality trumps animal-related interests. Arendt understood how problematic was the giving of rights, a declaration made by the free in the name of the bound. In the decline of the nation state and the end of the rights of man, she reflected on how the rights of man, supposedly inalienable, proved to be unenforceable. But she also understood why, when dealing with the stateless, the displaced, the strays, that no talk of rights could ever render them less banished from community home without any status anyone was bound to respect. To be given charity is not the same thing as to possess rights, and those who are abandoned to care know what such largesse makes of their lives. So in speaking of vulnerability, we must ask vulnerability to what? And then we must turn to dogs, and in the case I will discuss, the dogs victimized by dog fighting, who are then victimized again, ruined twice over, first by the dog fighters and then by the humane workers who save them only to kill them humanely. As one lawyer who defended pit bull breeders, wrongly accused of dog fighting, told me, morally superior people can euthanize dogs and it isn't called cruelty. How do we confront, then, the special vigilance of moral outrage? Social rationalism and claims of decency remain the twin engines that stimulate the prosecution of the poor and the suspect. Claims of humanitarian enlightenment notwithstanding, the politics of the state and the police power that accompanies it resurfaces when dogs and their sacrifice remind us yet again of the alienation and estrangement of animality and of the animal and modernity. Now, I'm going to skip over a discussion of how law has always been influential in shaping a new understanding of the relation between dogs and humans. But by the 1890s, suffice it to say, a series of tort cases began to describe, evaluate, and judge the limits of canine injury and death. 
They asked, what is the landscape of liability and harm? When can a dog offensive to humans be killed? Dogs are liable to extermination if their presence signals disturbance or danger. Does this sound familiar? Even if they themselves are not dangerous. And the killing of dogs is never without effects on the life of humans. The dog, like the owner, acceptable when domesticated but cast out when wild, is sacrificed to a social picture that depends for its meaning on the division between a polite, civilized, and a violent, savage world. Sometimes the division does not hold, since the violence of reason, though masked, is equal in its effects to that of irrationality cloaked in the semblance of care, a pedagogy of compassion that is, as Lauren Berlant argues, too often a pedagogy of coldness. Dog and human are killed as threats, but we know now that the engines of control, once systematized and embedded in human affairs, can be applied anywhere and to anyone. Where do we draw the line? Now, in The Law as a White Dog, I analyzed how legal rituals gave and took away personhood. It's now with my recent work on dogs' canine profiling and what I'm calling preemptive justice, and the means by which humans are dispossessed through their dogs, whether in a disaster like Hurricane Katrina, when only African Americans had to give up their pets, or in public housing mandates prohibiting any dog over 25 pounds. It is only then that I realize that personhood perhaps is not the issue, because it's not just a question of human disposal, but what tracks it. And whether that could be personalized or depersonalized, it seems to me it doesn't matter. I want to push then, as I've been arguing, beyond a residual humanism that lingers perhaps in vulnerability studies and also in any kind of personalist um, dichotomy. So I'm not in an easy position and I'm not very sanguine about the consequences of what this writing yields in the manner of political life. But it seems to me that the visceral uneasiness of some of the material might be a good thing because it is necessitated by the brute facts, even or perhaps most of all when legal logic seems to assuage the obvious pain and loss. Simply put, I want to present a problem, discriminatory practice that should defeat, it seems to me, any illusion of a common vulnerability. It is through dogs that I got here, and it is in the final analysis these dogs that matter, both to the men who have faced abuse and dispossession by state-sanctioned injustice and to the specific breed of dog that attaches itself to these men. Both creatures suffer, and it is their coupling that raises the issues of unequal power and status that I present. This is how this work began, with this story. Early on Friday morning, March 11, 2005, a caravan of vehicles drove from New Orleans down Louisiana Highway 89 to a home just outside the city of Lafayette, Louisiana, in the heart of Cajun country. State police, a SWAT team, U.S. customs officials, and federal agents with the aid of the Louisiana SPCA, LSPCA, and the Humane Society of the United States raided the home of the 75-year-old Floyd Boudreau confiscated his 57 American put bill terriers and arrested Boudreaux and his son Guy on 48 counts of dog fighting. The dogs were loaded into a truck and driven back to New Orleans. That night, the LSPCA began killing the dogs by injection. They did not stop until the next morning. By the time the Boudreaux were released on bail on Monday, their dogs had been cremated. Now, these dogs were not crippled, maimed, or blinded. Some had calluses, some had scars. Most were healthy, described as normal on the LSPCA's intake forms. 19 of the pit bulls were puppies, less than one year old. One of them would have whelped that weekend. Now, the veterinarian with the LSPCA testified that she conducted a hands-on exam of each animal. And she later testified that she found evidence of dog fighting injuries, and the animals were labeled fighting dogs. At the trial, it not only became clear that these men had never fought dogs, but that none of the dogs was injured. However, as the director for humane law enforcement said, these dogs harbored dog fighting genes. So once characterized as fighting dogs, the pit bulls were assumed inherently dangerous, 
and thus legally disposable, no matter the absence of any proof of dogfighting. An arbitrary label put an end to their lives without recourse appeal, even notice to their owners. Um, three and a half years after the raid, in October 2008, the Boudreaux's were acquitted of all the charges against them. The judge found no evidence of any crime. And I think it's very important that the intake photos of the dog show not only no signs of aggression, but no ill health are signs of dog fighting. Um, most, as I said, were labeled normal or healthy. Now, this case um, destroyed a line of dogs that had been raised for 50 years called the Eli dogs. It does make us reflect on the uneven uh, practice of justice and what happens to property in those cases when certain people have no power or money. And I want to close by saying that it seems to me that the legal is always in league with the kind of ethnographic critique. What I mean by that is assumptions of taxonomies or fictions, whether of blood or color, that always count more than any obvious uh, visible or facts. Legal fictions then subvert the safe havens of humanisms, the maneuvers of sentiment, and the claims of moral status. And I think it's instructive to watch over time how prejudice works, the circuitous routes it takes, the consequences of reducing persons to their accessories, as in the one-on-one -on -one lamination of the pit bull onto the African-American male. In other words, it's not the men you're afraid of, it's their dogs. And I think that this understanding of stigmatized property calls up what remains more profoundly mysterious and undetermined. Dogs are more generally animality. In approaching the question of vulnerability then, I ask that we rethink what we mean by natural, by recuperating as mutually adaptable the human and the animal, and what is particularly troubling, as I've been arguing, is the intertraffic between humanity and humaneness as it becomes a potently charged vehicle for the destruction of personhood property and far from the least, living beings on the basis of criteria that drift from the realm of human sociality and the law into that of nature and back again. A radical surplus of distance and distinction will always unsettle the oppositional limits between the human and the animal and the man-centered determinations of just and unjust, the worthy and the worthless, upon which the rigorous purity of these limits rests. To put it another way, and again in the form of a question, what is the social picture that may be coterminous with legal judgment that takes its meaning and garners its effects from the division between value and disregard? The language of threat and removal used to warn against vicious dogs also applies to humans deemed offensive or harmful. It is enough these days to be marginal, undesirable, or aesthetically unpalatable. With the new practices against immigrants whose homes are searched without warrants, who can be stopped anywhere on the basis of color, or what one police officer in Nashville called a Hispanic skin coat, the newly added measure against suspected misfits should give us pause. What is less obvious, it seems to me, is how canine profiling itself is part of a long-standing pattern of disavowal, a reiteration of disregard that puts animals safely to the side of moral action and importantly moral consideration. The one disavowal operating as a cover for the other the summary disposal of dogs often has nothing, as you, I have said, to do with liability and everything to do with status. It is a locally subjective, but in the end, legally imposable mandate for what is permissible. Finally, at its constitutive exterior, a phantasmatic animality haunts, I want to argue, the patrolled boundaries that modernity claims must obtain between what is proper to the human and what is proper to the animal. But we are also prompted to consider an older, enchanted world where voiceless and presumably mindless things were personified only to be forfeited and destroyed. Dogs then press us to understand 
how archaic forms of brutality are transfigured and made continuous with our 21st century terrors. If we were challenged to write a legal history of dispossession, perhaps we could go to no better place than the social tools of lethal acts and powers when bounded and sharpened by the dog kind. Thank you. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me today. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to um, talk about precarity and activism in Italy around and against precarity. A few days ago, exactly on the 29th of February, San Precario, patron saint of casualized, irregular, fractional, sessional, short-term contract, fixed-term contract, freelancers, migrant, in a word, precarious workers, turned eight. San Precario was born on a leap year in 2004, and he appeared for the first time in a supermarket in Milan. So, as you can see from this snippet of video, San Precario appeared in the shape of a statue, dressed as, as a supermarket clerk. He had multiple arms, and he was holding uh, a telephone to symbolize call center workers, McDonald's chips on another hand to symbolize chain workers, and a newspaper with job ads to symbolize the perennial job search. A priest, a nun, and a cardinal carried him in procession, followed by prayers, which continued inside the supermarket. There he performed his first miracle, declaring a 20% discount for everybody for the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since 2004, San Precario has performed many other miracles, including surviving as an organizational concept, as a symbol, as an icon of precarity, and evolving in other figurations, traversing a number of different media, being a regular participant in the Euro May Day parades, which are the precarious May Day that started in opposition to the union officially organized ones um, in 2001 in Milan, and that rapidly spread uh, throughout Europe in, uh, started in 2004, and that now have reached uh, you know, other countries as well. And uh, I just saw the poster of, I think it comes out of Occupy Chicago for the uh, May Day Parade this year, and the poster is very much about the precarious strike. So it is going to be a day without the 99% what happens if everybody you know, withdraws from uh, you know, daily activities. And this idea started in 2010 with uh, a migrant um, strike in Italy. Um, also, San Precario uh, has uh, uh, you know, in invented the Punti San Precario, which basically are free goal aid, legal aid centers. Uh, he has articulated specific demands, such as, for instance, reddito di base incondizionato, which is a form of um, welfare to guarantee minimum income to everybody under a certain uh, you know, income. And it's not based on any conditions. So, uh, you know, traditionally, this, this um, kind of unemployment benefit is uh, linked with things like, oh, you have to take any job that comes your way, and so on and so forth. So, San Precario argues that there shouldn't be conditions. Um, and uh, he has, more than anything, intervened beyond the traditional political institutions of parties and unions in localized projects and workplaces. 
producing a considerable body of interlinked imaginary and theory. Both this, this imaginary and theory are generated not a priori, but within and from actions and social mechanism of precarization. So the paper that I'm presenting today is, a, is part of a wider research project on the contact zones between creative and communicative practices in activism in Italy in the past 10 years or so. And my background is in visual cultures. And I'm particularly interested in the evolution and changes of a movement around and against precarity, and visual, and visual culture is my viewfinder to look at these continuities and changes. So today I will introduce some ideas developed around precarity, and then I will analyze the poetics and politics of some figurations created in the past eight years. San Precario, the unbeatable superheroes and tarot cards. When I started this project in 2004, precarity was an almost unknown word in English, and I had to translate it as flexibility, casualization, irregular and intermittent work. And I was often told that because I'm Italian, I got the wrong word and I meant precariousness. Um, as a term to designate social and political struggles of precarious workers, it was used mainly by activists, cultural and political theorists in Italy and later in Europe. Today, precarity has become a mainstream word and in a mainstream reality and a mainstream reality, and has produced a considerable debate among activists and academics in English in publications such as Mute Magazine, Ephemera, Fiber Culture. Um, Republic Art, Transvers Transversals, EFLUX, Theory, Culture and Society, and the Feminist Review. And as well as in Italian, where there is an enormous body of literature on precarity, and in French. In the last few years, the debate has moved also from journals into academic reflection and books. Um, precarity, I want to argue with uh, Angela Mitropoulos, who is a young Australian academic, is not simply the typology of employment of an underclass of workers, but it is the norm. The experience of regular, full-time, long-term employment, which characterize the most uh, visible aspects of Fordism, is an exception in capitalist history that presuppose vast amounts of unpaid domestic labor by women and hyper-exploited labor in the colonies. And this was Angela Mitropoulos. Drawing on this argument, I would like to argue the necessity um, also to think of precarity as differential precarity, articulated along the lines of gender and ethnicity. And for instance, in Italy, prob probably the most precarious people are um, domestic and care workers who are in the vast majority women from Eastern Europe and South America whose uh, permesso di soggiorno, which is the, the, uh, you know, the document, the residency document, uh, is linked to their ability to secure a job with a proper contract. Precarity is also the neoliberal instrument of governance and a biopolitical bio tool of regulation. In this sense, precarity can be seen as the social, affective, political, economic conditions brought about by precarization as intrinsic to the murder production of the current phase of capitalism. In other terms, as Alex Forti, who is one of the you know, uh, major um, uh, activists and intellectuals within this movement, um, he argued in 2004 that precarity can be thought of both as a position in the labor market and as an ex existential condition of being unable to predict one's fate or having some degree of predictability on which to build social relations and feeling of affections. The entanglement between this condition of existential vulnerability and social and political conditions and the nexus of this entangled condition with precarity is suggested by Judith Butler, who sees precariousness as a feature of life and precarity 
as a politically induced condition. Similarly, Laura Fantone, an Italian academic and feminist in our works in San Francisco, uh, describes some of the results of this politically induced condition in terms of increased vulnerability and erasure of the boundaries between work and life. In things like uh, you know, economic insecurity, uh, working off hours and uh, need to be mobile in order to follow very rapidly shifting job markets and to move from one job to uh, another. So the practices in this context, the practices of resistance that emerged in the <coughs> early 2000s in Italy and Europe were not simply based on oppositionality but also on the desire to generate new social connections and relations of support and to create new forms of common imaginary. <coughs> and as, it, as Isabel Loray has, uh, has noted, the peculiarity of these practices resided not simply in the development and testing of new forms of political struggles or <coughs> of new theories and practices, but in the way the movement inhabited from its beginning cultural and artistic spaces before social and political ones. <coughs> Sorry. It is worth remembering that the, the, the words precarious, precarity, precarization are a linguistic innovation that spread in the early 2000s from Italy, precarietà, France, precarité, Spain, precariedad, first to the rest of Europe via activist networks, and then after the 2008 global financial crisis, pretty much to the rest of the first world. So the emergence of a new terminology signals the coming into being of struggles and desires that are constituents of a new political imaginary and subjectivity. According to Italian operaismo or workerism, and I'm quoting here from Arthur Negri, the struggles of the working class precede and prefigure the successive restructurations of capital. Taking a workerist point of view, one could say that the forms of resistance and this particular cycle of struggles against precarity preceded the global reorganization of capital. In fact, what is the nature of these struggles? How are these struggles any different from other, if at all? What kind of demands are made by these new political subjects? Posts for this generation do not necessarily seek a permanent po position. This, as we have seen, was more of an aberration of Fordism than a norm. Than, you know, the norm, I mean, the uh, stable employment. Um, underlying the concept of uh, uh, you know, the demands that are made that are essentially the reddito incondizionato, the minimum uh, you know, way, income without conditions, are uh, the concepts of social factory and immaterial labor that were developed in the 1970s to analyze the changes in the shift from Fordism to post-Fordism and to redefine the notion of worker away from factories and other formal places of work and into the fabric of society itself. And this is sometimes you know, connected to the idea of immaterial labor. Immaterial labor being uh, uh, you know, not simply um, the post-Fordist and post-modern shift from job based in the industry to job based in the service industry like producing communication, information and knowledge, but also job based in the care industry affect labor according to our heart, also produces immaterial goods such as affect social relations and desire. Senses of instability, peril, uncertainty coalesce around the notion of precarity. Precarity becomes a modality of control over life itself. In, itself, in this sense, it's an articulation of biopower. It is intended as a prerogative of a government power to manage and control life from its interior. This control is not limited to the erogation of income, but in the case of precarity, it invests other spheres such as affect health, 
housing, transport, communication, education, environment, mobility. Moving a critique to Foucault's focus on power and mobilizing effect, Hart counterposes biopower from below in arguing for an affective dimension which evades, resists, and exceeds the new modality of control. This inversion of biopower along the lines of effect is also, I think, the core of the practices of resistance of, to precarity. So Durga writing the, the tiger or precari of precarity can be read as an example of these practices. So drawing on a non-Catholic religious imaginary this time, in 2001, the organizer of the May Day, designated as the May Day, the year of natives and migrants, designed a poster with a modern and Italian day version of the goddess Durga. Durga is the invincible. She is a form of David, the radiant goddess, the embodiment of feminine creativity, represented in classic Bengali iconography riding a lion, and in other incarnations riding a tiger. Durga fought and defeated the demon um, uh, Mahishashura, who had spread terror in the universe and could not be defeated by anyone. Durga has multiple arms, and each arm holds an object representing the hair powers. The precarious Durga holds in each end icons that graphically articulate the claiming of rights. The right to health, mobility, environment, water, housing, communication, education, income, freedom of movement. These claims not only aim at putting forward demands, but are also at the core of production of political subjectivities. Thus, the struggles and action originating around precarity are characterized as constituent conflicts where the production of a common imaginary plays a central role. So I will briefly explore a set of figurations chosen because they exemplify poignant aspects of practices of resistance against precarity. The autonomy of imagination with some precario, the embodiment of precarity in specific life worlds and lived actualities in the superheroics, and the relational character of these practices in the tarot cards. To analyze this figuration is necessary to understand different and intersecting cultural grammars. At a macro level, one of such grammar is given by the shift from 40s to post 40s system of production and its repercussion at a social and cultural level. More specifically, immaterial labor transferred the site of production into the spheres of communication, knowledge, information, affect, and desire. The response, therefore, can be articulated with intervention that mobilize communication, information, knowledge, affect, and desire. An intervention, in other words, at the symbolic and imaginary level. I will start with San Precario. San Precario, as I said, is the pattern saint of precarious, casualized, sessional, intermittent, temporary, flexible, project, freelance, fractional workers, and he appeared for the first time in 2004. It was first conceived by uh, a crew of Milanese, Milanese activists called the Chain Workers, and one of the groups that were sharing a space in Milan called Reload. The saint appeared in public places, um, in occasional marches, rally, intervention, demonstrations, and he appeared that year at the Venice Film Festival together with uh, the Lions. Uh, he appeared in some fashion parades and being a saint, of, of course, procession. And uh, um, this saint was thought of as a pattern saint of all casual workers, not just one category. So from knowledge workers to uh, uh, you know, chain workers. So a cult spread very rapidly and led to the development of a very distinct and colorful iconography, hagiography, and rituals. It appropriated the Italian tradition of carrying the same statues in procession in urban spaces, but functioned as a, at the same time as a detournement and as a temporary autonomous zone and as a carnival. It was also a tactic to make visible issues arising from the increased casuali casualization of the workforce. At the different level, it was a site of poetic production. Uh, in 2005, more or less, it went underground and uh, had just cameo roles in Euro May Day parades. 
And in recent times, it has uh, resurfaced, and uh, he now has a Twitter account and a Facebook page. Uh, you can like it. And, um, <laughs> and this story, I think, this story, uh, the beginnings and the transformation can be brought into play to explore the current politics and poetics of precarity in Italy. So the basic idea was to communicate to people with no political experience, like you know, kids working at McDonald's. Um, and to do so, the chain workers realized that there was the need to use a comprehensible language or to use another expression to operate within uh, a shared cultural grammar. So from the beginning, San Precario was ima imagined as a detrimental of popular tradition. This tradition was appropriated in its formal aspects and subverted in its content. So his life was, um, uh, for instance, told in the genre of the life of saints, um, and it follows very traditional formulaic development. San Precario also had a saint card, and you see here, you know, if you want real saint cards, and then the San Precario card. Um, and it was adopted, and the, the image was adopted from a Canadian artist called uh, Chris Woods. And he is represented wearing a uniform, and uh, the card includes at the bottom uh, the saint's attributes, which following the traditional iconography are also the signs of his martyrdom. And uh, what you can see is income, uh, housing, transportation, communication, and health. In 2005, the chain workers, and again in 2006, came up with another idea, another figuration, a set of 19 stickers, 19 different characters with different superpowers, and an album like those collected by children. In this period, they were called the Imbattibili, the Unbeatables, and it was also the year of the Disney Pixar movie, The Incredibles. Um, these characters are not superheroes, they are superheroics in the struggle every day against precarity, intended here not simply as a work condition or typology, but as a, as a social dimension. Each of these figurations refers to a specific group of casualized workers to a certain life world and to a particular experience of precarity. Here, for instance, you have uh, Super Gioppino, who is uh, an organic farmer and in favor of a short production and supply chain, uh, a community medical center, and here you have the uh, my own completed <laughs> album of stickers. Um, this album has also an online presence which articulates the singular part into existence. Stickers are under Creative Commons, you can download them, and you can link each character to a story, to certain superpowers, and to the node that originated it. Um, Precarity in itself, which is pretty much an abstract concept, is here grounded and deployed in lived and, and uh, very practical example, examples, easy to understand in their reference to popular culture. Abstraction in general, uh, and, or general concepts are substituted with the singular, the particular, the descriptive, the embodied and the emplaced. In this, the unbeatables are a critique to notions of an absolute precarious subjects, which is generally thought as white male and in a white collar precarious job, and reground precarity in localized experiences. The website also invites people to collect stickers and finish their album during the parade. Each character was invented and created by a distinct group. Some created the tournament of classic comic book superheroes, others were freshly invented. Some like Operatore X, um, which uh, uh, was created by people juggling several precarious jobs at time, references another um, invented superhero, and he was invented with political aims in mind as politics of the possible, the Mexican super body of Gomez. Uh, 
This, the relational articulation in various parts of the superheroic sticker album, as it happened, was not simply a matter of how the idea came about and was produced, but most importantly, how it was performed during the May Day Parade. The sticker album, in fact, was conceived to create new relations, although mostly fleeting in nature, nevertheless, new relations that require people interacting in an event. A similar tactic was deployed in the 2007 May Day with um, a game of tarot cards, which you see here. This Euro May Day parade was conceived as, as an example of socialized media, a concept that was developed by the chain workers to, me, to, to signify means of communication that enable to those who participate in the action to represent and leave relations that cannot be reduced to the simple reproductions of goods. It was therefore thought of, of as a site or as an event to create relation. Indeed, it was a gathering of strangers. Uh, it also produced communication, imaginary and political subjectivities. And it, it, it incorporated a variety of tools, was intrinsically intertextual, multisensory, and cut across different language and means of expression, incorporating written and spoken words, music, and images. Originally, tarot cards were not simply used to foretell the future, as in the popularized version, but rather as a tool to read the forces in the present, forces that work outside, inside and outside one person that are determined by the development of events. Visually and conceptually, the Euromedae tarot cards subvertise the traditional deck, bringing into play new figurations, able to push people to think about what happens around you and to suggest some strategies to react. There is also an ironic inversion in the association of tarot cards and precarity, since one of the common traits of social precarity is the difficulty in foretelling one's own immediate future. Like, where is the rent coming from next week? So it is important to understand that tarot cards function within the context of the Euro May Day parade. To start, different floats were associated with different tarots. At the beginning of the parade, one could buy for one euro the Almanacco di Precario Mancia and the instruction on how to play the game. One would also receive one or two cards. The instruction directed people to certain floats where they could collect some cards. In the process of being given a card, as you see here, one was given information about a particular experience of precarity, and one was also likely to start chatting with others. Because participants followed different floats, and because I think some cards had been printed in greater numbers than others to create expectations, they collected several um, doubles, and soon the swapping started. There was a lot, of <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of trading there. Finally, for the last few cards, participants were instructed by the agents of precarious intelligence to go through a test to determine their knowledge of precarity. And for each right answer, they received one card. During the parade, people started to swap story and be together in what called, Bakhtin would call a carnival sense of the world. So the tarot cards created new social relations. During the swapping of cards, people swapped also information and tips, tricks, and stories. The tarot cards traditionally use an instrument to read the future here became a tool to tell the present. In this sense, the cards became an instrument for storytelling as a political practice. Zoe Romano, who is the graphic designer who designed the uh, precarious Durga and who's also uh, you know, very active in uh, the construction of the May Day Parade, um, T told me this story, and I will quote for, from here to finish. Several people, this at the beginning of some precario, several people started writing to the website, narrating their experiences, and recognizing themselves through this storytelling as precarious workers. These narrations were an antidote to the fragmentation of relations which characterizes precarity.
the impossibility to create relations in the workspace, which is no longer a community. It is through this storytelling that a shared condition is discovered and a shared space is created. So all this figuration, San Precario, the superheroics, the tarot cards, acquire and create meaning in the exchange. Their value is therefore relational and not simply iconic. To create social relations, just like precarious workers in their flexibility create relation. They are also the, they, but they also result from already existing relations with the movement that rather, that from rather localized realities with very specific concerns to a network. They are webbed realities, realities in relation. And this is, I think, what images do and what these practices of resistance that I've been talking about do. It is a sort of unproductive production that does not create tangible results and a non-productive production which in turn creates dissonance and conflict, but it also creates sensibilities, relations, debates, affect and subjectivity. It creates in a word possible in a word possible worlds. Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists for really stimulating um, presentations. We have about a half hour left for some conversation among the panelists, and then we want to open it up to conversation with the audience. So I'm, I think I'll just ask if any of the panelists would like to say anything in response to another presentation, raise questions, um, get a conversation started. Eva. I have a question um, about this panel. Um, it struck me as I was listening uh, to both of your papers in relation to our papers that somehow uh, we took this concept of vulnerability or precarity and in order to think action, new relations, new legal status of the human, and new possibilities of action, the panel went in two opposite directions, this notion of the creature from the animal to superhuman. And I understand that the cards are, um, acquire their possibility from the web of relations, but nonetheless, all they have in common is a certain notion of the superhuman, whether it's uh, saint or magic or, and I think that's important to think um, how we think about this worldly concept from those two different uh, angles. So I wonder whether you have to, anything to, to say. I think you're right. I think it's fascinating that... Oh, Colin, can, you use the, can you use the microphone? Oh, yes. Thanks. Okay. I think it's very interesting that both of you raise the issue of, of vulnerability as a theoretical tool. And I think perhaps you're right that we broke off in uh, different directions. I think maybe the real question is how each of us sees the political, or what is the most urgent political question today? And so I guess um, in explaining where I'm coming from, I do think that um, equality is a kind of myth, of course, but I think that also theoretical vulnerability might also be a kind of myth in that discrimination is a term that I think needs to be held on to because if you look at the 2.3 million inmates in our prisons, they are mostly African American and I don't think we can escape now the problem of ethnic profiling but also what Michelle Wallace has called the new Jim Crow. So I, kind, I very much want to hold on to the old fashioned notion of discrimination and stigma because I always fear that another theoretical framework is at work to kind of in Chinua Achebe's words, to universalize a condition that really remains rather specific within the United States, I think, so. Um, if I can follow up on this, I mean, my, uh, uh, you know, my, the, the reason I think why the, the kind of imaginary that is produced draws on 
um, ideas that are things that are not human, like uh, yeah, the superheroes or uh, you know characters in tarot cards or saints. And there are a lot of saints. So it's not just San Precario. There are others that have been produced. Um, is uh, um, it, it, it is very tactical uh, for a start because it allows to uh, you know speak from within a, a language that is understood by um, you know people who wouldn't necessarily be interested in politics or even know that they are precarious workers. So that's one thing. But I do agree that. Um, you know, I, I'm quite interested in developing this notion of differential precarity because, uh, yes, it's true, we are all precarious in an existential uh, sense and also in a political one because we live in a particular states and, in a, and if you want also uh, we are, um, uh, you know, subjects to global forces and global capital and so on. So yes, we are all precarious, but there are some people who are more precarious than others. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, you know, it's like, yes, I am, I am a migrant. I'm a migrant in Australia, and uh, that doesn't make me very similar to uh, a Senegalese man who has migrated to Milan and who doesn't have, you know, regular papers and so on and so forth. So I, I, I do like the idea of um, relocalizing and grounding and talking about the emplacement of precarity and vulnerability very much. Martha. Yeah, just a couple of responses. Uh, one, I, as I understand a vulnerability analysis, it does not ask us to leave behind a notion of discrimination or in fact respond to discrimination um, when it occurs. But I think what it does recognize are the severe limitations with an anti-discrimination model. The first being, of course, that it is perfectly all right to discriminate all you want as long as you don't discriminate uh, against people who have certain characteristics. Um, so it's, and, and even within those characteristics, there's different levels of judicial scrutiny. So uh, when it comes to, uh, to race, it's strict scrutiny when it comes to gender, it's uh, intermediate scrutiny, and when it comes to everything else, it's is this really so arbitrary that we can't possibly justify it. Um, Anti-discrimination uh, actions and legislations are notoriously unsuccessful. Uh, so that's another objection to discrimination. They, um, in fact, are the least successful uh, actions that are brought in courts, and even when plaintiffs are successful, um, they are uh, uh, overturned on appeal at a rate that exceeds other kinds of actions. Um, this is because discrimination really revolves around individual action in two contexts. One it, re one, it requires individual intentional discrimination against someone who belongs to this limited set of categories. And second, it requires individual harm. So you can't bring a kind of notion of group discrimination if you can't show that you were directly discriminated against and directly harmed. So I think about this anti-discrimination as necessary, but far from sufficient for handling the tremendous structural uh, inequalities that mark our society and the increasing inequality um, that we see and that have actually prompted things like um, the uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, movement. So um, I, when I talk about the two kinds of differences, the first difference embodiment, of course, allows for anti-discrimination remedies, even given they're limited. The second kind, though, the institutional positioning within webs of relation, relationships and economic relationships is really after a kind of structural inequality that transcends um, the identity categories that discrimination is built upon. So I, I think it's really, for me, significant to be able to, to in both incorporate but move beyond uh, a mere anti-discrimination model. The second is that I think there are actually three divisions on this panel. <laughs> um, because I, I, uh, as I understand precariousness, and I must admit it's a relatively new term to me, um, it seems to me that it, it, it's talking about things in a much more limited and much more individualistic manner than I am when I talk about vulnerability. Uh, precariousness is something that is done to you. You're placed in a precarious position 
talking about, you can think about this in terms of institutional operation, so I can, you can understand that as, as one aspect of a vulnerability analysis. But again, vulnerability is also positive, generative, um, and, and vulnerability applies to institutions. I mean, again, its strength for me is that it takes us from this individual positioning to an institutional and ultimately state responsibility. So I think it, um, you know, I, so I would position three different, yeah. three different positions on this panel. I just want to say um, one other thing about um, the way you, uh, just, you know, a phrase about t transcending discriminatory categories. I guess I have a fear of transcendence in whatever form it comes. And again, I think it, it is um, that the particular and the emphasis on particularity leads both to the creaturely and to the gods <laughs> or the superhuman. A and that's because, you know, there was an, uh, an article in the New York Times that is still haunting me. It was by Nicholas Parrott. Why is the NYPD after me? And it was in the Times just uh, a month ago. And he says, every time I go outside, I have good reason to think I may find myself up against the wall, handcuffed or lying on the ground with a gun pointed at me. And so I think that there are particular conditions of life for particular persons of different class classes, but most specifically of different colors that put them, oh, I think if they heard, well, we perhaps can transcend, they would say, well, every time I walk on the street, you know, I, my color isn't a vehicle for transcendence. So I guess maybe the divide is one of a theoretical position uh, versus a kind of more local, maybe. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, because yeah, it is, it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't say which discrimination doesn't exist and it shouldn't be addressed. But what it does say, I think, and, and this comes from someone who has 30 years of experience with the legal system based on anti-discrimination, that it is not enough and that we need something in addition to that. So it's not rejecting what you're saying, but it, what it's saying is that that is not enough. And in fact, that is not the only problem that How we as a society How do you foresee a legal case being brought forward, maybe to explain to everyone, um, on the basis of vulnerability? Well, it's really interesting. I've been, uh, we've been developing this as a notion of ed um, legislative ethics. So there are models, uh, and I did want to mention also a lot of these rights that people talk about, the right to housing, the right to employment, are rights that exist in international human rights documents and apply to countries like Italy and <laughs> France and you know wherever they, they, ha they have all those rights in place, uh, incidentally, so I just mentioned that. So, um, but one of the things that I'm really interested in is how we can structure um, a legislative ethic that really takes seriously that our government should not operate to privilege some and disadvantage others in the um, allocation of resources. So uh, there is something called the Commission for Children and Youth in the UK, for example, and it is an independently fund, it's funded by the government, but it in, operates independently. And any time there is any piece of legislation proposed, um, the commissioner has the, the responsibility to take that to the NGOs, to the university communities, and assess what will be the impact of that legislation, if any, on children and youth? Um, there's gender, something called gender mainstreaming uh, in Europe where every piece of legislation, again, not only the legislation that looks at women, every piece of legislation is, to, is supposed to go through a process that evaluates what are the implications for gender equality if this legislation, in fact, or this government program or this policy, in fact, passes. So when I think about vulnerability, uh, and the human condition and talk about this in terms of, of legislative ethic, that's what I'm talking about. The role for the courts here, and I think quite often people misunderstand law extremely narrowly, not as something that shapes our everyday lives, which it does, but just as what courts do. But the role for the court here, this is a legislative ethic, the role for the court here is to see that that process was appropriately followed and the information that's generated then becomes part of the political process um, really gives us an idea of 
uh, what are the implications, who's pri going to be privileged, who's going to be disadvantaged. And again, privileging in and of itself, just like discrimination in and of itself, is not inherently evil. But there has to be an explanation for why it's necessary and appropriate in any specific case. So um, that's, that helps you think about implementation. Um, I just wanted to um, clarify something about precarity. <coughs> I'm not talking about precariousness, in fact. I'm talking about precarity, and it has a, 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 a quite particular, if you want, political history. <coughs> Sorry as a concept, and it is a history that comes out of, uh, uh, you know, Italian radical philosophy, essentially. So I'm not using precarity in, the, in, I, in the sense of vulnerability. It is, it has a very localized history, okay, so, yeah. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that, yeah, it is true that there is a right to housing, right to health, and so on and so forth, but the fact that they exist and the reality are quite different, unfortunately. Um, I want to open this up to the audience for questions and comments. There should be microphones and people holding microphones to bring to you. So if you could raise your hand. Um, regarding pit bulls, have you studied pit bulls, their history, early history in America where they were? Yes, sort of, yes. Yeah, because to me, that, I love that you use that topic you know, and bring it back to the humane and what we're doing. But it's so fascinating that they were child care providers, really. Thank you. They, so were, they just, were nanny dogs. They were nanny dogs. So I think it's just wonderful. It's, and Well, it is, um, it is intriguing to see um, how the pit bull, what shall we call it, um, since it's so widely applied to all kinds of dogs who are not necessarily the American pit bull terrier. Um, it began in the 80s, and it, this uh, condemnation and degradation and fear mongering about the breed began at the same time as the prison system also began to um, the very much an ethnic institution uh, defined by uh, ever-increasing numbers of African-American men. And um, of course, all kinds of stereotypes and labeling give us indications of where we are at a specific point in time. And as you say, what's fascinating about this particular breed is the way in which, in some sense, it's always been exposed to extremes. Either the American dog, the hero of World War I and World War II, and the nanny dog, totally idealized, and on the other hand, totally denigrated. So I think that this way of demonstrating that whether it's an extreme of idealization, as all of us who are women know, or denigration, the two things are not that different. What happens with hyper-idealization or hyper-degradation is that you've evacuated the element of the person, <laughs> of the actual essence of the being, and it's always a projection of someone else's fantasy. And so it is um, very, very uh, interesting to look at um, in a sense, you might say it's kind of like flies to shit. The way in which certain kinds of prejudices and language experiments accrete onto the pit bull and their owners. I mean, the Michael Vick case as opposed, let's say, to the saving graces of certain white middle class liberals who are saving the pit bulls. So you have, again, the extremes of those who can redeem and those who only damn. And so it's an interesting um, kind of, shall we say, litmus test to how people's perceptions and prejudices are shaped and changing um, you know, over, over time. And again, I'm so fascinated by your work. And as I said, I had read <coughs> an article on the 
vulnerability in the law. And one of the other questions I had, though, um, is that the European Commission on Human Rights, the Convention Against Torture, as well as the Geneva Conventions, the United States has been so expert continuously in evading these legally. I mean, the way in which Article 16 of the Convention Against Torture, the warning about cruel and unusual punishment, you know, in the European Convention, it's inhuman and cruel, inhuman and degrading. The U.S. refuses to sign on to that language, and actually has a uh, an exemption for the Article 16. They direct us back to the Eighth Amendment and the wording of that cruel and unusual punishment. And I think that there's a real big jump from what is happening in the US legal system and what is happening in Europe. And the best book I've read on that is James Whitman's book on degradation as the single most important thing that distinguishes US practices of law from the European model. And he traces it all the way back. So again, um, in practice, I guess I would question given the recent torture memos and so on, just how, how much the US uh, legal system and uh, certainly the state authorities are willing to embrace these really um, terrific uh, legal histories that very, very much of the European conventions are based on. Well, two things. One is that the Europeans are ad uh, adopting an anti-discrimination model and they're doing that increasingly, and I now have visiting me as visiting scholars finding out about vulnerability, people from all over Europe, including most recently uh, two uh, researchers from the European Court of Human Rights who came because the European Court of so Human Rights is thinking. So I think Euro Europeans are, they're, they're, they're moving towards us. We, we're very successful at exporting our worst ideas. Um, <laughs> and, and we really are. Um, as far as importing ideas, um, Justice Scalia and others have referred to international human rights as foreign fads. Exactly. And there was, in, at one point, uh, legislation in Congress pending that would make it the basis for um, impeachment of a, a federal judge who used uh, any Absolutely. international human rights concepts. Uh, that did not pass, but who knows in the future. Uh, anyway, um, so I, I, you know, I think That's why we, I'm we have the, the uh, yes, w but, but the vulnerability approach is not a rights approach. It is not a human rights approach. As I said, I started that way, thinking about mm -hmm. it as a stealthily disguised, but I realize it's an all-American project. It's really giving meaning to our cherished ideas of equality of opportunity and access. That's really what it is. And I go back and look at historically the moments in American history where uh, we acted consistent with those ideals, including the Great Society and the New Deal, including the uh, enactment of the original constitutions of the states and some of the constitutional provisions in the states. So this is not a foreign communist plot. It is an all American <laughs> project about equality of opportunity and access. And don't we believe in that? It's, it was a wonderful panel, and I learned so much. I'm wondering, as we try to theorize vulnerability and reclaim it for feminism, or claim it for feminism, if we don't have to think of the affects of vulnerability and floating vulnerability as a key concept. Uh, and I thought about it when Eva talked about the older vulnerability studies, which is about security and becomes an alibi for all sorts of things that we don't want to claim. Uh, how do we keep from making fear, paranoia, anxiety, uh, all those things that make us lock up all these people, uh, the key affects of vulnerability and how do we mobilize other affects? And um, I'd just like anybody on the panel or in the audience to help me think about that. Thank you. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, very important question I didn't even uh, uh, touch upon. I, I think, uh, um, uh, 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 you refer to this in a Negri's response to, uh, to that, uh, but I, I'm a, a, a little bit, um, maybe it's kind of psychoanalytic streak in me, uh, uh, wary about the production of affects because it just um, uh, gets away uh, 
from the unpredictability of affects that surprise us all the time. You think you are just uh, such a good person and you are startled by your own visceral reaction that is so much at odds with your convictions. Uh, so I think uh, other that kind of vigilance and working through these affects, I don't have much of an answer other than sort of uh, and confronting them head on. And also maybe thinking, I mean, that's also why I find on the one hand two very incompatible allies very helpful. One, psychoanalytic concept of working through. But on the other hand, uh, I, what I like about Levinas in particular, that the obligation, the unpleasant uh, force of obligation comes in the way of accusation from the other. And of course, when we are accused, I mean, the immediate sense is a hostile response. And the kind of necessity of working through that and acknowledging that kind of uh, violence often in us that comes uh, to being put on the defensive position uh, is crucial. So this is sort of not even scratching the surface but indicating directions. First of all, I wanted to say that I actually see a unity in the, in the panel. And it seems to me that it's in the nature of the critique of the political subject and that that's what we're all in different forms trying to grapple with. But the but it, I also think is the corollary in that in a second edition of this, I would like to see more of is the, therefore the critique or the analysis of where we go in terms of the understanding of the political space. And I thought that Ilaria's talk on the precari or in the precari and San Precario and all of that was a very nice illustration of a series of reversals in terms of how the, po the political is posited and the relationship between the political and the social. But I would like to see that analysis go be taken further on. And I just want to mention three basic concepts, I think. I think, Martha, when you distinguish between an American project and a European project, in part it's because lurking in the European project or in the European framework is a concept of social solidarity, which is closely tied in to the question of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. But what I see in all of the discussions today is actually also a critique of the premises, not just of liberal individualism, but of traditional understandings of social solidarity and the nexuses between that and community and community and the state. And I, I think that those are the sort of next steps in a way. It's, it, it's not enough to stick with the subject. We have to understand what space we're trying to construct. Thank you. That was an excellent summary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to give the panelists one quick chance to respond if you would like to. Yeah, um, just one thing in, in terms of the uh, fear, paranoia, and anxiety, the effects. Um, I think if we don't confront a vulnerability and understand it, then we can be manipulated when it's impossible to avoid our vulnerability. And I use 9-11, uh, Katrina, and the financial crisis as the three examples in the first part of the, uh, the first decade of the 21st century to show how that Americans' perception of our own vulnerability has been profoundly altered. And in each of those circumstances, vulnerability has been manipulated to evil ends by evil people, I won't mention who they are. Um, so I, I, I think that, uh, to me, uh, tr uh, trying to ignore vulnerability and trying to ignore dependency does not mean that they go away. They continue to exist, it's just that we don't understand them. So in terms of where we go in, in, for political space, um, I do think uh, social solidarity could have been produced or by those three events that I just mentioned, but it wasn't. And the reason that it wasn't, I think, is because of the way we understand the political subject. So it seems to me it's really important to transform that idea. For me, um, transformation of political subject goes hand in hand with thinking the, the spaces for action. And I think it was kind of nice at this panel that we were thinking uh, conjunction between institution transformation, but also kind of grassroots specific movements and action. And I, that's what I was kind of thinking about when I was talking about Arendt. 
and that requires a space. But in a way, at the same time, it creates a space mm -hmm. when such a space does not exist. So I would like to push further uh, in my own thinking this world building capacity that action creates as a kind of alternative to counter public space that we sometimes use because that uh, assumes that it pre-exists and sometimes it does not. And uh, it's kind of amazing that people who have been absolutely expelled from the public can create a, this kind of alternative public among themselves as a network or web of relations. And that's what uh, this kind of solidarity promise was kind of at the back of my mind. Yes, I want to thank you for that. I, I do think that the next step, the next uh, forum should be on what we mean by political space. Because as you say, the notion of community and the idea of zones of exclusion work together sometimes seamlessly. And I, I think an exploration of what, what the spatial uh, surround looks like, or as I said, what the landscape for harm and liability looks like, these things are really intriguing and I think do give us another way in besides the subject, the political subject. And I think that, I mean, as you know, those who followed Arendt, uh, Agamben, and Foucault understood it's all about the spatial dynamic. So thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much because it's actually very stimulating to think beyond a political subject. And I, I'm not really sure where I will go with it, but I, uh, lately I've been quite interested in uh, uh, bringing, if you want, a post-colonial perspective into how we think about uh, certain forms of uh, uh, political subjectivities in the West. And um, this especially after the R London riots last year when uh, you know, the general critique was that the riots were not political because people were not articulating politics. Well, it seemed to me that they were articulating politics very, uh, <laughs> uh, very well. So this notion that there are masses that are pre-political uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, you know, it's becoming for me quite interesting together with, uh, and, and I would like to link it together with uh, some um, ideas that were developed in uh, Italian feminism, um, well, the different feminism, uh, about women as pre-political subjects, women as uh, the wild body who could not articulate politics and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, those are probably the directions where I will go, but it is about, yeah, creating a different political space, probably. Thank but you. I want to thank the panelists for a very stimulating set of presentations. <laughs>